Hello, and welcome back to the Automate Live desk. Once again, my name is Jana Martin. I'm the Media Production Manager for the Association for Advancing Automation, and we're really excited to be featuring this interview with one of our winners of the Innovator Awards this year in the software category. Joining me on the desk to help host this interview is my co-host, Jimmy Carroll of Tech B2B. Jimmy, it's great to see you today. Thank you so much for having me. I appreciate it. Awesome. And then, of course, we have from AMD, we have Julio Karate, fellow industrial vision, healthcare, and sciences. Great to have you with us today. And then we have KV Kenjar Beskar, and you are the robotics lead for industrial vision, healthcare, and sciences at AMD. Thank you for being here today. Oh, thank you very much for having us thank here. You. So let's just start things off really quick, and why don't you guys just give a brief background about your roles and what you do at AMD? Absolutely. Uh, I'm a principal architect within the industrial vision and healthcare and sciences uh, team, so even an AMD fellow. So what I'm doing is basically is overarching the technology, uh, the AMD technology that is applicable to industrial systems, uh, medical systems, uh, and vision systems. Uh, fundamentally, that is my that is my role within this particular segment. My responsibility at AMD is um, the robotics market lead with the within the industrial vision, healthcare, and sciences team. I've been with the, with AMD for about seven years now, based in Boston. One of the most interesting thing about my role is that I get to work with a lot of robotic startups, right? And understanding their needs, their challenges, and how our technology can kind of bridge that gap, and how our technology can keep up with what they are requiring. That's, That's a fun awesome. Job. Yeah. And we're really excited. You guys won the Innovator Award this year on Monday. Congratulations Thank again. You. Thank you. You have your technology here at the desk with us. Is there anything that you would like to show us and tell us about it? Uh, first of all, I want to maybe give a huge shout out to the large amount of team members that were involved, right? It didn't, uh, it took an army to make this happen. Maybe very simply, if I can start, we are in a show floor that is filled with robots and automation systems. They have tons of sensors, uh, different kinds of sensors and sensor modules. And typically these sensors, their value increases when you are able to interface with them in a real-time manner, in a predictable manner. And this is done on a specific compute platform. Then, if you look at uh, the other end of the spectrum, there's a large, large amount of compute requirement, and that happens on another system. So what we are doing with this AMD Embedded Plus is we are bringing our versatile adaptive SOC that can take on the sensor interfacing uh, real-time response and predictability, and then the Ryzen Embedded CPU that can now take the enormous amount of compute requirement, put it on the same platform, so now you have one platform that can address uh, the both ends of the spectrum in an optimized way. Yeah, there's a couple of terms that you guys have put out there on the Embedded Plus page because I've, I've had the chance to look into this. And I wanted to ask what you mean by things like sensor-friendly and adaptive system on chip. What do those mean to you? Uh, Julia, I'll start maybe. Yeah, you, please you, go you, ahead. Feel free to add. One of the things you want to pay attention here, so this is a mini ITX motherboard, a standard PC form factor you'll see in many um, instruments. This has many of the standard PC interfaces like a USB and Ethernet. Sure. But we just mentioned there's multiple kinds of sensors and sensor types. So they need specialized interface. So we created these uh, uh, I.O. modules that bring in these physical interfaces into the platform. But how are we making that happen? Is one of the features of this um, virtual adaptive SOC is that it has something called programmable I.O. These programmable I.O. can be um, used to interface with any kinds of sensor. So now you have solved one major problem of bringing these sensors directly into this board without doing anything else. You are now bringing vast variety of sensors into the platform directly. So yeah, I mean, it's, it's not just a, I would say, um, being friendly means not just a piece of hardware, means basically a, an architecture. This means that many sensors require real-time processing and very fast response time, especially in robotics, and moving forward with AI, you will need more and more sensors uh, that uh, requires uh, basically coordination. So what we are doing in terms of sensor friendly means that uh, we have the ability through this connector to the programmable I.O. to the capability that is uh, in this particular versatile device uh, to get uh, uh, a pre-processing, so to filter away, to execute some uh, operations like uh, uh, pre-AI, for example, massaging the, the data points, so transforming the information that is coming from the sensors uh, in a way that uh, could be 
better ingested by uh, the main processor. In this way, this architecture is decoupling, so separating, the part that, uh, that requires a very fast response, an immediate response, a predictability from the one that requires a, a high compute. Yeah, I, I, I try not to get too deep into having this be too product promotional, but I'll say that a, a partner of yours said, hey, you should really ask them about the, you know, what a versatile FPGA and Ryzen CPU, what does that bring to customers? How does that make systems integration easier and what new benefits does it offer? Uh, it, it making, a, so, so from a designer standpoint, uh, is helping in doing one particular thing, so decoupling, uh, the critical you know, uh, data handling, uh, where you need, as I said before, uh, a very fast response, uh, from the part that requires, uh, let's say, uh, data processing. That is a very important conceptual point. It's not related to the product, it's an architecture. This architecture allows you to have, first of all, a single board, uh, in which you normally, I would say, uh, in, in other uh, situations, uh, you have different boards. Uh, so when a system moves, for example, a robot is moving, you have vibrations, you have many you know, elements that are concurring in creating a, you know, a non-optimal platform. In this case, uh, the operations are, first of all, executed on a single board, the second point executed locally, third point executed inst instantaneously, Third point, uh, you know, the information is flowing between the two devices uh, in a way that uh, you can do most of the processing as a front end, filtering away the, the, the data, and then the rest of the parts is executed on the x86 product. So it's, it's, it's a conceptual element, it's not just a promotion of a product. Sure, yeah. Well, one thing I, want, I, I notice here is that these, these aren't really physically big, and you look at a lot of GPUs today, and some of these get, they're, they're massive. Massive. Uh, and GPUs certainly have their applications and their, and their you know, Absolutely. deep learning and AGI and everything, but should people, in your opinion, right, should people start thinking of FPGAs more when it comes to AI and deep learning and absolutely 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 there are there are a couple of things first of all we are we are trading uh, basically uh, speed per power so less power we have the, the FPGA allows you to execute things uh, with a high degree of parallelism especially I would say as a front end for for the sensors uh, high end parallelism means that you can use a, a less uh, let's say less speed much uh, more parallelism elements that are running concurrently and in this way you create basically you know the the amount of power that is required is in general much less because there is a, a relationship between the power and the frequency and this relationship scale significantly as soon as you go down in terms of frequency and you enlarge the parallelism i think in the previous um, question julio mentioned about the pre-processing of pre-ai so when we look at ai we are also looking at the whole application acceleration Right? So of course the AI inferencing is a main piece, but then when you get the data from the sensor, you need to do some pre-processing to the data before you feed it in and then post-processing. Now, with the AI accelerator and the FPGA, you can do all parts of the entire pipeline, so it leads to lower latency and as Julia was mentioning, higher performance for the amount of power you're spending for, for the AI inference. Obviously, edge AI and AI in general is a very hot topic. But you know, beyond that, what are some what are some different industry verticals or different applications that you think this would be particularly useful in? I mean, with, with things like you know, you need real time feedback, right? Absolutely. So there are many of those applications. Uh, is not just in uh, in automation. So, for example, as I said, uh, robotics uh, uh, is one of is one of those. Uh, specifically, I would say elements that uh, requires, for example, programmable logic controllers is another one. We do we do have many elements uh, that concur so over there. For example, this particular element, uh, when you require uh, uh, networking, it could be plugged in and then you can execute high performance networking in this particular system. It requires a, a video interface, uh, you execute those things just changing the interface but without changing uh, the, the logic. The other things that is very important and we might uh, spend hours in discussing those, those elements is that in uh, in the next uh, in the next future, you know, uh, safety and cybersecurity are becoming paramount, especially in this particular field. And uh, this particular product is enabled for functional safety and very much designed for cybersecurity. Those are the two elements. Uh, Kevin, if you want to add, to add yeah. something, I'll, I'll maybe add one example to make it um, 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 uh, visualize it. Right. So today, if you look at um, machine vision, is one of the other verticals, and medical imaging is another vertical. Mm -hmm. So if you look at a med medical imaging application, which is outside the world we are in today, right, in the automation, uh, but you have a ultrasound probe, which is a specialized sensor, 
it needs something to then understand the sensor data, and then it needs a computer to run the hospital IT infrastructure. Same thing if you look at a machine vision application, there's a camera that's capturing the camera images, but you need a frame grabber that understands what the frames, then a PC to run the machine vision stack. So now this brings the frame grabber and the PC into one module, right? So robotics is one uh, vertical, network offloading is another one, machine vision is another one, yep. medical imaging is another one. And mm -hmm. these are kind of the four main target applications for you. Okay, great. Well, thank you. Yeah. Um, uh, another question that, that your partner is a friend uh, asked me to ask you about is uh, leveraging the x86 software architecture. What benefits does that bring? I'm, I think we are more than happy to mention the partner, right? Uh, <laughs> mainly because uh, Concurrent EDA and uh, Dr. Ray, they have been uh, a strategic partner of us. In fact, uh, they have helped many of our customers be successful in, in, in their deployments. So going back to the machine vision application, right? Concurrent has their own machine, machine vision software stack. So today they run it on an x86 system that then connects into a frame grabber, into a PC. So Ray was excited because now he can bring the frame grabber and the x86 on the same platform, run his software on the x86 side, which is very tightly coupled to the uh, frame grabber that has all the data. And now he doesn't need more cables because it's all on one board. It's under around 30 watts of power, right? It's in one, it's saving overall form factor. So that's why Ray is excited because he's already started going. And actually at, the, at our booth 3450, Ray is showing one of the machine vision applications running on platform today that was just released in Feb. Oh, very cool. Yeah, I'm glad that you mentioned it. Um, partnership seems to be a really, a really driving theme at this event. You know, it's I mean, it's always been important, but um, one of the big takeaways, if I were to list three or five partnerships, might be near the top. You just see a lot of different companies uh, showcasing their collaborations together, and it's great to see. And it's very exciting. What, what else are you guys excited about at the, you know, in the general space? In general space, uh, uh, I would say uh, a, a lot of things. I mean, we have been here in in showing this particular incarnation with uh, with Embedded Plus, but you know. Uh, we, we are seeing an explosion of uh, AI, we are seeing an explosion of all those type of applications that in the past uh, into you know, industrial automation systems were relegated, I would say, were, were a little bit marginalized, I would say. But today, I mean, uh, AI is changing, the, changing definitely the landscape. What we are doing with this particular action, and that we are extremely excited, is bringing the AI clo much closer to, to the field, much close to the factory floor. And uh, in this particular case, as I said, we combine, uh, for example, the two worlds, the world in which we have, for example, an ARM processor, an AI accelerator uh, over here, plus, I would say, an x86, we combine, for example, with ROS and ROS2, that are the robotic operating systems that could run in, uh, in the front end for the sensor ingestion, that could run in the back end for the processing. That is an element in which we are extremely, extremely excited. And as I said before, the fact that uh, in the next uh, future functional safety is becoming paramount, that is one thing we, we are not just excited, but we are also investing significantly in this particular, in this particular domain. In general, all our products that deal with, uh, with robotics, uh, with medical, with uh, industrial automation are going to a full, uh, a full set of uh, I would say certification, and that will be definitely very, very important for the future. I don't know, KV, okay, there are many other points I can talk for <laughs> hours. Uh, you know, yeah, I'm, very, yeah. I'm extremely excited. Exciting, yeah. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> if you can add I something. I, so. I think, I, I think uh, Julia covered a lot of ground. Maybe just to add one other point would be um, digital twin and simulation, right? The reason is now we, again, with the power of AI, with uh, generative le learning, taking a step back. Digital twin is when you are able to virtually represent the physical world. So you are basically reflecting anything happening in the physical world on the virtual side. But now, on the virtual side, you can already train, giving it a I don't know, vast range of different behavior situations. And now it's a learned model that's like coming down to the physical world, which basically means the physical world is super optimized without ha actually having to spend time in the physical world. So that kind of like virtual physical boundary is very exciting and it's moving like rapid pace. We have, I don't know, I felt like just weeks before I saw first humanoid, now everyone has a humanoid, right? That's how quickly this is evolving. So it's very exciting to see. 
additional point that I would say. I mean, uh, with, in, in order to create uh, those particular, say, solutions, uh, you need uh, a, a full infrastructure, a full pipeline. As I said, we do have the ability to ingest the signal, to pre-process them, to have a local compute, then moving things, uh, as KV was saying, up. Uh, we, we do have the standard, you know, uh, compute. We do have the GPU for the visualization and rendering, and then the mechanism that could be then offloaded uh, into, into the cloud and then back. So there is a full pipeline. So AMD has very an enormous amount of uh, capabilities offering this particular plant and uh, in my opinion is uh, is one of the unique values so from the sensors uh, up to the visualization in a single pipeline mm. that's uh, that is extremely exciting yeah indeed what i mean any predictions for the next year or two ai in two letters awesome well congratulations yeah. again kv and julio and all of amd on on winning the innovation award this year at automate um, if you want to find out more about what they can do for your business visit their booth there's still another hour or two you can or check them out on the internet thank you so much for joining us for this episode of automate live <laughs>